Welcome in to the KSO Sunday Show. Mason Voth, Drew Galloway here with you. Uh, fan was just with us a minute ago, and right as we started, he disappeared. So, Like literally 30, 30 seconds ago. Yes, just moments ago, uh, and he just gone like a flash. So, uh, we'll, we'll, there he is. He's back. Uh, let's, let's, let's try this all over again and, uh, add him into the fray there. There we go. He's here. Uh, well, we're getting things worked out here, uh, with, with everything going on, but, uh, let's, let's just start from right at the get go. The most positive piece of news that we can tell everybody about this week with K state and it's that the Wildcats are in first place in the Big 12 Conference still. After a weird and wild day yesterday in the Big 12, uh, where KU ends up losing at West Virginia and Baylor, I mean, if their overtime loss at K-State didn't hurt, not only was it a painful way to lose to Texas, but you have to deal with the fact that Texas on that same court like four days ago just lost to UCF and you couldn't beat them. Uh, tough, tough pills to swallow for those two teams and K-State and Texas Tech through five games, like we all expected are leading the big 12. So, uh, with that in mind, I'll start with Drew here. Uh, what would you make of K-State's current standing in the big 12? I, I mean, I feel like the, the correct thing to say is like you, you take it cause it's you're in first. So like you're you're in first the the schedule has been kind of favorable, although in the Big Twelve there's not really a favorable schedule. Like I kind of touched on that uh, in the what we learned thing uh, piece that from the game uh, yesterday. It's like you you take it, and now it's you have a big opportunity in front of you because you probably only need to get one if you want to stay near the top, and to kind of get where you want to be. And we kind of brought this up after the game of like you win one next week, then you host Oklahoma and you go to Stillwater, two winnable games. And are, are you seven and two hosting KU on big Monday? Could be like it, it, it takes the whole season kind of turns into like, do we think this team is a tournament team to now it's okay. What do they need to do to potentially win the league? Well, I will say this: it's it is a similar spot to last year's team, where you know they they were fine in non conference play, but maybe left you desiring a little bit more. And then they get off to a really good start, and you do start to have to ask yourself, even though you, you probably still don't think it can happen. Like, do you start to have to tr to treat this team like somebody that could win the Big Twelve, or at least that should be the expectation now because you are leading it five games in and the fact that you have a game advantage on teams like Houston, Baylor, and Kansas, who would be the favorites in this league right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask fan this, should we be treating K-State like a big 12 championship contender right now, just solely based on what the record indicates. And, and now, you know, five games is not a small sample size. K-State has won 80% of the games they played in the big 12, I mean, is this significant? I'd, I'd say it's, it's significant. Um, you're doing what you spo you're supposed to do with the schedule you've been given, which I think the, the good teams in the league are going to do. Um, you, you narrowly almost got another road win as well in a close loss at Texas Tech uh, that you probably should have had. But um, you feel good about where you're at, but things can change quickly in this league too. I mean. Everybody, but one team is two and three or better after five games. So um, there's not a big separation between anybody right now. And then you're playing, you know, two of the best defensive teams on the road this week. And you're going to learn a lot about your team and where they're at. So I, I'd, I'd say, you know, for the quarter, basically the quarter way point of the season, K-State's in good shape and, and doing what they're supposed to be doing and what they need to be doing. Um, but it's going to take – to be a title contender, uh, for real, I think you got to at least split this week. So this week will be pretty telling um, to, to what K-State's going to be if they're just going to be kind of a bubble team trying to get to nine wins in the Big 12 or if they're going to be that team that's trying to get to 13 – 12 or 13 wins, which is probably what it's going to take to win this league this year. By the way, if you pull up the standings again, 
if you thought that the Big 12 title game scenarios were a cluster in <laughs> football, you got another thing coming basketball season wise. The tiebreakers, it's going to be incredible to figure out who has the double yeah. buy. Yeah, I I don't I don't envy the Big 12 in this situation. It makes it a lot tougher. Uh, and look, I mean, look at the jumbled mess right now. You have the two at four and one, but then everybody else is three and two or two and three, except for Oklahoma State, uh, <laughs> which makes Mike Boynton's comments all the more funny after last night's game when he's talking about like, oh, I, I don't know, look at this league. I, I don't know that anybody doesn't have two losses already. I, I don't know a single league that, and it's like, <laughs> Well, the team you just played only has one, and there's another yeah. team that's like that. And I said to Drew, I was like, what's also funny about him saying that is the Pac-12, literally every team has two losses already. It, I don't know when or, or Oregon plays today. If Oregon loses today at Utah, they will end the weekend with everybody with at least two losses, and that includes Arizona, who should be kicking the crap out of everybody in that league. So it's not like the most unheard of thing. I also think everybody in the Big East has two losses already. Everybody in the Big Ten, except for Wisconsin, has to like not the craziest thing to say, Mike. Uh, but then for him to be, you know, say that and look around, it's like, oh, everybody has at least two wins except for you. You, you know, like it, it goes both ways, winning and losing, uh, unless you're Oklahoma State. I feel bad for Mike Moore. I think he's a nice guy, but just a tough spot to be in. So let's just let's dive into it. Let's start there. K State gets a 70 to 66 win last night against Oklahoma State. It's a big win for the Wildcats as they trailed quite a bit of the game, almost 24 minutes worth of game time. They trailed, and they were down by 10 with just over 10 minutes to play in the game. But they got Arthur Kaluma to step up in a big way at big times. Cam Carter had some really gruesome struggles early in the game. He's now turned it over 11 times in the last two games. And you get a little bit at the right moments from Tyler Perry or early on Will McNair and David Gasson kind of carried the torch. Uh, what what do we make of how K-State was able to find a way to beat a bad Oklahoma State team yesterday? Well, I, I think um, we talked about last week that Oklahoma State, the strange thing for a Boynton team was this one could shoot the ball a little bit. And uh, that was kind of my biggest concern coming into the game as far as my the keys I thought for K State to win the game was was not getting beat badly from behind the arc. And for for a long part of that game, that's exactly what happened. Oklahoma State shot 43% in the first half and then made a couple early in the second half. And for most of the game, it seemed like they were shooting 10 to 15 percent better from three than K State. And then all of a sudden it kind of flipped down the stretch and you know, I kept thinking, well, K-State's got to make a run at some point to get back in this game. I think about the seven-minute mark, I, I put a tweet out about that, that K-State hadn't been able to put together points after uh, getting stops. And then all of a sudden, K-State goes on a 7-0 run to, to take the lead in the final four minutes. And that was kind of the story of the game. And then K-State made enough plays down the stretch to win the game. So... They finally got that run. It took uh, longer than I had hoped and thought would happen, but they did get it done. And that, you know, sometimes that's what's going to take. It wasn't K State's A game by any means. Maybe a B minus C plus game for K State, and you win in this league. You gotta, you gotta be pretty happy with that. Yeah, I mean, you. It's one where kind of unlike when football played Oklahoma State. K-State could kind of get away with playing their B minus C game. And it's a game where you kind of saw K-State was a, slep, a step slow and you think, okay, is everybody just kind of tired and kind of everything from Tuesday night? And then you hear that there's a sickness going around the team and you start to puzzle everything together and like it makes sense of kind of why they just kind of looked lethargic and a little bit slow. But it, it's a game where you don't get many times where you can take an off night or have an off night in this league and still win. So to manufacture a win and this team, the other thing that I wrote, that's kind of just the main takeaway is this team is the, one of the most clutch K state teams. I can remember like the amount of times that they make winning plays at the end when they kind of have more or less no business winning the game. 
it, it just shows that this team is full of winners and they, they just push the right buttons and drone tank pushes the right buttons for them. Um, it, it was a game where like you don't really understand how K state won, but when you on like a micro perspective, but macro you're like, okay, well, they also had no business beating North Alabama. They probably shouldn't have beat Chicago state with how they played. They should have lost to Oral Roberts. It's like, you see those other games and you're like, okay, that's how, because they kind of just pull the rabbit out of their hat a little bit. And it's kind of like what Mason talked about when we talked about uh, the K-State women, where every three yesterday felt like a big one for K-State's men, because it, like they just were struggling so much to make one that it felt like when they finally made one, they came in big moments. Well, yeah, I think Stan went and looked at it for Arthur Kaluma because it felt yeah. like everyone he hit was a big one, and the timing of him it, it backs it up. Yeah, because it was Chris Nelson in our group chat mentioned made a point, so I went and looked it up. We were down seven twice when he made threes to cut it to four, and then we were down nine one time when he when Kaluma made a three to cut it to six. So, keeping a game within three possessions uh, when you're struggling is a big deal because. Because when it becomes that four or five possession game, that's when you can start to panic. And this team hasn't shown really those signs of panic. Maybe maybe the Nebraska game, we saw that a little bit um, where they panicked. I think they simply got outplayed the first two losses against USC and Miami. Um, just outscored. Those teams were just hot shooting the ball in those games. Because um, Nebraska was just a grinder rock fight game too where case they didn't make the plays and then then it became that four or five possession game that you can't recover from and that's what it felt like Oklahoma State was about to do multiple times in that game that you know Kaluma really made some of those threes that really kept that from happening well and you know it's it's funny that you you mentioned like avoiding getting it to four or five possessions most of that game I wasn't overly concerned about case State I, I kind of thought hey the run will come They'll, they'll, they'll get this thing going. But, you know, it got later in the first half, and it seemed a little dicey. And I think Kaluma hit one of his threes mm -hmm. when they were down seven right before the end of the half. And so that was significant. And then Oklahoma State got the lead back up to 10, and that was probably at the point where I went, yeah, I don't think it's happening tonight. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the last 10 minutes of that game, I didn't think K-State was going to pull it out until they did get it within a score or so. And then I thought, okay. The better team is going to win this game. They're they're going to figure it out. They're going to be they're going to be better built for the situation, and that proved to be true. Because at the end of the day, bad teams lose games. That's yep. that's what they're proficient at. And Oklahoma State showed that yesterday. And to some extent, good teams win games. And at this point, like you have to give credit to K State for being a good team. They they find ways to win games, and they they know how to pull this stuff off. So. Uh, I, I thought it was, you know, impressive that they came back and like you said, fan, they panicked in some other moments and they didn't last night. Uh, it seemed, and you know, Kaluma, he had the last 11 points of the first half mm -hmm. really kept a minute. And prior to that happening, we had been talking up there. Hey, like you look at Carter, Kaluma and Perry, they've done nothing tonight. I think they had to combine three points mm -hmm. when we started talking about that. And they eventually got it figured out and rolling because, you know, Cam Carter, he struggled mightily early on, but he ended up in, in double figure scoring and made some big buckets down the stretch. The, the, the shooting efficiency was there for Cam yesterday. It was just absent of, you know, his head a little bit in the first half. I mean, he's turned it over 11 times in the last two games this week. Uh, that's not very good. So uh, they're impressive and they found ways and they all kind of locked in and, and made it happen. So last night was a good win to back up what you did against Baylor uh, to make it stand up because I mean, broken record time, but I always say like the, the big win doesn't mean anything if you don't go out and prove it the next time out. And so many times it seems like you get that big win and then you get a lesser opponent that you should beat. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, we saw it last year, right? But K-State beats KU on a Monday or Tuesday night in Manhattan. They got to come back on that Saturday against Texas Tech, who was not a very good team, and take care of business. It wasn't a pretty game, but they found a way to do it. And, you know, we've talked about it in football as well. You know, the win against Oklahoma last year, they came back and they beat Texas Tech the next week. And, you know, it wasn't like a blowout or anything, but they found a way to get it done. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big thing for this K-State team right now.
Yeah, that and that speaks about what good teams do, like um, winning games when when you're not at your best and winning and and not getting caught up. And I think even in the post game, Coach Tang kind of hinted at he thought the guys were getting a little bit, you know, looking at the record. It's you can't help it. You see a Oklahoma State team that you know hadn't had a hadn't won a game against a top 150 Ken Palmer net team this season, so. Guys, look at that. They'd lost their last three games by an average of 21 points in Big 12 play. They'd only really played Baylor close. So it's human nature to, to kind of look at that stuff, even though they all say they don't, and then get get yourself a little bit in trouble when when those games get tough and, and Oklahoma State comes to play, and Oklahoma State actually is playing some defense, um, which they hadn't done a lot this year very well. So um, it's it's good to win those games. It's a lot better than losing them for sure. And uh, now K-State gets to look forward to a, a tough week. Yeah, and it, the the thing, of, and Mason and I talked about this actually like on our way out of Bramlage last night, that there's a point where analytics and Ken Palm and the net ranking are all good and everything. But then there's times where like you look at K-State right now, uh, like 71st in the net right now at 14 and four. Mm-hmm. But then you see like Michigan State 11 and seven and 24. And now they're 12 and seven after winning today. So, like, at some point, you just are what your record is. And K State's a good team. Like, I, yeah. I, I have no doubt about like saying that right now. Yeah. You, you've got to at some point just respect what a team has gone out and done. I will say this too, and, th- and this kind of goes into something that we can talk about at some other point with uh, maybe like the resume stuff. It It's funny because what net is going to end up doing, and most of the time the quad system is, is good and it's a nice way to quantify and give people just kind of a general idea. You look at a team, you don't know much about them. Hey, here's what they've done against these teams in these tiers. But the one flaw that it can have is – or benefit, depending on who you are, K-State is going to be hurt by the net in in the long run because they played USC and Miami when they were much different teams and when you played Mm -hmm. them when they were good. And so, you know, what Mm K-State got at that time, totally different versions of what those teams are right now and probably finish the season as, although Miami, I think, could pick it back up still. Um, But they're three and four in the ACC, and it's not like their losses are to anybody special. so K-State's getting hurt by that. A team like Nebraska is benefiting from playing K-State at probably one of their lowest points, and they're going to benefit from beating a different version of K-State that is going to probably only go up in the net, although K-State dropped uh, this morning from 68 to 71 uh, after uh, after yesterday. But like Nebraska will benefit from that, and that's the one flaw that I see in the net is that Overall, yes, but you're going to find some outliers in there where you know the, the team is different at this point versus this one, and it's going to hurt some and it's going to benefit others. And I think that's why, like with K-State, you can't be looking too hard at these metrics right now to try and say who or what they are because the wins are what proves who they are at this point, especially what they've done over the last five games when you started conference play in, in the toughest conference in America. Yeah, and then and then you've got teams like Villanova and Providence who are struggled with in, injuries. Yep. And are, mm-hmm. you know, probably bubble teams right now, both of them. Um, but at the time when we played them, were really good wins and they were very strong teams. So, you know, it, it's been a little bit of bad luck. And then K State didn't help themselves by playing close games against four quad four opponents. Yeah. Yeah. And going to overtime with two of those. So you you don't they didn't do a good job of gaming the net by blowing out the bet teams they should blow out and then um you know a little bit of bad luck with the non-conference opponents kind of falling off more so than than they thought you know because right now maybe sandy uh south dakota state is leading the summit and probably looks like the team that could win the summit so that could become a decent win you know a win over uh, a low major title team is not a bad thing to have but um it's just a little bit of bad luck um you kind of overcome it. K State's going to have plenty of opportunities. They still got what ten or eleven more quad one games in the league. You go out and win four or five of those, and you're you're going to take care of yourself. Hey, and shout out to West Virginia, who uh, with their win yesterday, 
they now become a uh, a home quad three game instead of quad four. So <laughs> good for them. Uh, looking at a couple of other things with K State this week, we can go back a little bit further. They take down Baylor. They come through in a big way in that. Go to overtime. You get your fifth overtime win of the season. And this was something that was brought up yesterday as well as in the game against Baylor. And it was afterwards with Jerome Tang. And somebody asked, you know, like at the time, those games did not look very good. But like, is there any benefit to them now uh, when you you went to overtime with North Alabama and Oral Roberts or you, you struggled and had to play tight ones with Chicago State or whatever? And, and you know, he, he basically said, yes, like obviously they would have probably liked to have played better in those games. But this team needed experience in a lot of different ways and they got it in those games. And the good news is they didn't have to learn a really tough lesson in those games by losing them. Uh, how, why, why do we think K state has been so successful in tight games and finding a way to overcome some very big time self-inflicted wounds, uh, to themselves in these games? Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, even when, when coach Tang talked about Cam Carter, um, and that he has a very short memory and doesn't remember mistakes and doesn't let them impact him later in games. I think that's a little bit of it that, that Tang, you know, I think probably learned this with Marquise Noel um, to let guys go, try to make plays on the offensive end, especially. And sometimes that's going to come back to bite you. And, and I think we see that with the turnovers this team commits where I think they're being overly aggressive and, um, trying to make plays that aren't there many times. Um, but, it, you know, when it when it becomes a shot clock game down the stretch and teams are trying to just make plays possession by possession, number one, I, I think you tighten up in, in how you take care of the basketball and don't quite take the chances, but then you still have the confidence to go make that play uh, because you're allowed to, to – make those mistakes earlier in the game, you know, it'd be nice to not make those mistakes because then you don't have to go make plays down the stretch and you just win by 12, which is a lot funner for all of us. But, but I, but I think it's that knack that tank coach tank has for building confidence in his players to make those plays. And, and I think, you know, you do have to go through the growing pains of, of the mistakes that are made, but then when it gets to crunch time, we saw it last year, we've seen it, we see it this year. I think, I, I, I think I saw thir I charted us at 13 and four in games that are four points or less or overtime. Um, that's a pretty good record in close games uh, against quality teams. So um, that's on Coach Tang, putting them in position. But then I always say the final four minutes of the game is about players, not plays. Um, you've got to have them prepped. You've got to have some schemes in place. But if players don't go make plays, you're not going to win those games. And that's what this team does. And that's what last year's team did. That, that's a lot more eloquent of a way that I, I was also going to say that it was, it's just kind of like Coach Tang where you just kind of expect KC to win games like this now. It, and it's what makes kind of the Texas Tech game just such an outlier of like, that's not usually what happens with KC under Jerome Tang. And, and I don't want to say he's, he's at this level yet because obviously like the, the track record is still pretty small. But it does feel a little Bill Self esque that whenever the game is tight, you just kind of feel like K State's going to win. And he does it without the refs, you know. <laughs> I was very frustrated with those guys yesterday. Uh, yeah, look, I, I mean, he is. I think it's his personality. I think it's, you know, he he understands that he's learning alongside his players that are also learning. And I, I think I, you know, for as smart as he clearly is at being a basketball coach, we already know this uh, after a year plus, even close to a year and a half. Like he still knows that there are things that he just isn't going to to make the best decision on or know best. So he's open to changing his mind. And I we saw that last year with Marquise Noel, and we're seeing it this year with certain aspects of this team. And I mean, I, I think that's why we've seen certain guys come off the bench and, and get minutes that we wanted to have anticipated where there's a lot telling him, no, I should not be playing this person right now, but 
you know, nothing else has kind of worked. So I might as well see what happens. And it's paid, it's paid off at times. So I, I think that's probably his best quality. And I think that's why, in addition to uh, his personality, why his, his players like him so much is because they're well aware that, hey, I don't know much of what's going on and neither does he at times, but we're going to help each other figure it out and learn. So that's uh, that's that's a big time deal. Uh, one quick question about l last night's game for you guys. I said earlier that you know ten minutes to go, K State's down ten. I didn't think that they were going to to come back and win that game at that point. It just didn't seem like they were going to be able to do it. At what stage last night had you guys given up hope on K State and said, "Yep, this is just not the night"? Because I mean, I, I've i talked to my dad and brother today, and they both were like, yeah, I still thought that they were going to win this they, that game last night. I was like, I did up until they were down 10. So at, at what point did you guys say, yeah, I just think this is one of those nights where you lose a game to a, a bad team that's due, and you do yourself no favors in coming out flat? Or maybe you guys are uh, in the same boat, and you, you looked in the round and said, no, I think they're winning this game. Some way, they're going to do it. Uh, well, I actually have a text uh, that I sent with 713 to go in the game that I said, I just don't think that it's K State's night. And that it, it just, it because it just didn't seem like it. I mean, to be honest, uh, K State was down 59 52 at that point. And it, like Cam Carter still hadn't gotten really going, Tyler Perry hadn't made any shots. But it, it's crazy to look at the score at that point. K State outscored uh, Oklahoma State eighteen to seven in the in the mm -hmm. last seven twenty nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know I was in my you guys and when that Connor Dow kid who I didn't even have in my top ten <laughs> players going into the game on when I break down opponents I didn't even have in my top ten of guys that I thought would impact the game when he made a three and then he made a free throw on the next couple of trips later and it kept the lead at seven and then six. That's kind of when I was like, I don't, and I didn't see the offense doing enough to, to, to make it happen. So that's kind of when it was for me. And then, you know, a couple of trips later, they finally got it going and uh, starting with uh, Will McNair making a play and then some, some free throws from Kaluma on a fast break and, then you start making plays, and it just didn't seem like they were going to be able to make the plays, but then they flipped the script. I, I was about probably identical with you, Drew, on my confidence dropping at that point. By the way, shout out to Connor Dow. I think that he either, <laughs> he either – I think he either made the shot or airballed every single time. It did right? feel like that. Yeah, we got an yes. airball on a free throw from him too. <laughs> Just it, you know, it's a rare occurrence, especially for a guy like him that you would think would maybe uh, shoot it a little bit better, maybe just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Look, I I think it's kind of strange that the way uh, things played out there for K State yesterday and and how they kind of battled to to go and get the win, but they you know they did some good things even throughout the struggles yesterday, mm -hmm. not just offensively. I mean, the defense. Oklahoma State, I mean, they made threes, which we have seen this year. They do that better than any other Mike Boynton team ever has. But the real killer yesterday for, I think, morale more than anything throughout the game is when you had a guy like Eric Daly making some of the shots that he was mm -hmm. making because mm -hmm. he took a number of them yesterday where I looked at it, I was like, man, you live with him shooting that. Like, that's okay yeah. to let him do that. There's no way they keep going, and he ended the game by making – 60% of his shots and and his one of the misses was a three. So he was pretty efficient at what he did. He was the real killer. But outside of that, I mean, K-State forced a lot of turnovers from Javon Small. That was a big deal and really kind of prevented him from being a true difference maker in the game. Same for Bryce Thompson, who struggled. And coming into the game yesterday, those were the two guys that had averaged double figures on the year. They were the two offensive threats you had to worry about. And at the end of the day, we probably look at it and say that's probably something that these guys were aware of, Jerome Tang and his staff, and figured, you know, if we do a good job of shutting those guys down, it may be closer than what people want it or think, but if everyone else is having to contribute and chip in for Oklahoma State, 
we probably win this game because th those are the two guys that are that will kill you and give them an actual opportunity to overcome. And I think that's why K-State outlasted Oklahoma State yesterday is they held down the two big dogs and everybody else, yep, yeah, you can do your thing here and there. But at the end of the day, that you're just you're, you're that's not how you win games at Oklahoma State. Yeah, I, I think the the Bryce Thompson point is really good. He had four, four turnovers, went four, two of eight from the floor. His efficiency was zero point four eight, which is really bad. Um, and then Small and Thompson combined for nine turnovers between yeah. the two of them. So that, that's really good defense on those two to take them out of their game. And especially Tom, Thompson was coming off a twenty point game against KU where he played really, really well. So um, really good defense on those two. And and if Eric Daly beat you, so be it. And he, he didn't do enough to beat us. Yeah, so the, the combined numbers on those two guys yesterday, they combined for just 18 of the 66 points for Oklahoma State. They're 33% from the field. They're under 30% from three. And then, as you mentioned, they had nine turnovers in the game. So you you made their two guys not play very well. And you look on the other end for K-State, while Carter and Kaluma both struggled, they put up big numbers. They were 38 points, and they shot it really well. I mean, combined, they were 12 of 21 from the floor, and they were 6 of 12 from three. Uh, so they came through, they made it happen, and then Kaluma and, and Carter also came up with, with pretty solid rebound totals. Uh, and Kaluma also had four assists yesterday. So he kind of did everything, including those turnovers, but he, he more than made up for it because mm – -hmm all or maybe most of them at least were in the first half. Uh, yeah. That was uh, <laughs> that was where Jerome Tane joked after the game that Arthur Kaluma came up to him and said, did you know that that I got my 1,000 today? And Jerome Tang responded and said, turnovers? <laughs> uh, which, was, which was pretty good uh, in, in the moment. So, like, those guys came through, and, and, and they're the big talking point from yesterday because of how they scored and the fact that they overcame adversity. And it feels like the same thing we talked about after the Baylor game where th these guys had some struggle points, but they found a way to turn it on and be a difference maker later in the game. Tyler Perry has had moments like that this season. And I, I referenced Keontae Johnson in Nebraska the last time we talked about it. Uh, I, I think it's the same type of thing. That's a, that's a pretty telling point for this team and where things are going with them. So we'll see how that translates to this coming week because it's not the easiest week for the Wildcats. Their second week already that they're going to be on the road the entire week, two games at Iowa state and at Houston. Uh, it gets started on Wednesday in Ames. What are the expectations for this week and how tough is it going to be for K-State? I mean, I, I think the expectation is probably to win one game. Like you, you don't know which one, but this team has played so well on the road that I think that you are probably right to at least expect one. Uh, both of these two teams, the last two years, 51 and five on their home courts and both are 11 and 0 at home this year. So you're, I don't, I don't know which one they're going to get, but if I was to guess, I would probably say it's probably more likely to happen on Wednesday. Because K State should have won the names last year. Yeah. So you look at this year, Iowa State's still really, really solid, and they're really good at home. But I, I just I like how K State's been playing, and I, I just trust them. If the game was going to be tight, that they'll just find a way again. Yeah. I mean, congrats to Houston for beating powerhouses like Tulsa and <laughs> East Carolina, and you know Tulane and South Florida at home. Uh, they've, I mean, they've, they've done the Lord's work in surviving that gauntlet. It, not like, everybody can beat South Florida at home. Yeah, that's true. Uh, not to mention, uh, that, you know, they tight lost a really good temple team that came in there and, uh, beat them last year in Houston. That's, that's why I think that the cats are capable of getting a win this week is because mm -hmm. I think they, I think they can compete and we can have a really good game on our hands when we watch K state and Iowa state play on Wednesday and then you show up on Saturday, and you don't know what could happen. It's going to be – I think it's an 11 a.m. game, isn't it? It's, yes. it's an early tip. It's early. And, like, you just don't know what you're going to get there. And, I mean, yes, they handled UCF yesterday, but the final score is 57-42 to 42 between those two teams. Like, mm -hmm. 
it's not the most confidence inspiring performance by Houston if you're you're looking at what they do. So it's going to be fascinating. I I think the way K State's doing things right now, I think that they do go one and one on the week. But I'm not going to be surprised if they go zero and two. And as long as it's not a total disaster and they lose both games by 20 points, I, I I'm I'm telling myself right now that I'm not going to come out of it disappointed or changing my opinion of what we've already seen because these first five games should probably outweigh most of what could happen in the two games on the road this week at Iowa State and Houston. Now, if they somehow won both of them, we're having a very different conversation next Sunday. Uh, so yeah. we'll see. Mm-hmm. Fan, what are your thoughts on the the, the two games this week? I, I do think it's going to be it's going to be tough. Um, both teams do some things that can bother K State. Um, they're top top six, top ten in the country in preventing you from getting shots at the rim. Um, Iowa State it was number one last week before their weekend game, and Houston was number six in percentage of shots at the rim allowed on defense. Um, K State's you know one of our biggest traits, best traits is is shooting at the rim and getting shots at the rim. Generally about 40% of our shots are at the rim and we usually make almost 70% of those. So that's going to be a challenge. Um, Kim Palm says 19% at Ames and 7% chance in Houston. Um, although Houston's gamed the metrics a little bit with how they've played this year. Iowa State has two. I was going to say Iowa State has two with their, their non-conference schedule. But, but I think you're right. Um, the things, the qualities this team has with being tough, uh, don't we don't mind a rock fight game. Um, I think they're both going to be rock fight games, probably 62 or three possessions. Um, and it's going to be about, you know, our big three making plays. I think, I think at least one of those games, I think we need Cam Carter to have another one of those breakout type games where he's getting to the rim, getting into the lane. And then he's been shooting a well Big 12 play from three. So you got that going for you, uh, which can be a big help. Um, uh, I I agree with you. I I think, you know, I think at least one of the games is going to come down to the final four minutes and and what team can make plays down the stretch um, in in case they've been good in those games. So um, that's going to be a challenge, I, I I would say, the odds of winning one are not high, but this this is kind of reminds me a little bit of the week, you know, going into at Baylor at Texas last year, where that team kind of took off, and this is the kind of opportunity for this team to do the same, to really up the the expectation level of what they can be and what they can do. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. It's going to be a couple of tough tough games, but but I do think there's a good shot they can at least pull out one of them. Yeah, and like an 0-2 week isn't the worst thing. I mean, you look at it, K-State's going to be probably a sizable underdog in both games. Yeah. So, so you, <laughs> you you win one of those and you feel great. It, it's where like just treading water on the, on the road mm-hmm. in the Big 12 is great. Like win one, you move on. Like And like you could win the Iowa State game in case they could lose to Houston by like 20 and I'd still call it a good week. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah absolutely. Yep. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And and we'll kind of see where, you know, things end up for uh, K state next week on the road. I mean, obviously two pretty talented teams uh, and, and Iowa state, they won on the road yesterday in Fort worth without Tame and Lipsy uh, who has got a shoulder injury. So his status might be up in the air for the game against K-State. I don't think that they know yet if he will be available for that game. Obviously, that'd be a major boost to K-State's chances if he's not on the floor for them. Um, I guess the one the one thing we should talk about this week is what kind of impact will the turnovers have? Because it does feel like K-State is doing a lot of this winning in spite of themselves, and we know that the turnovers are a really big sticking point. Uh, I mean, number one is that – is there any chance that this team finally gets that under control this season? And number two, how prone to victimizing that flaw in K-State are Iowa State and Houston? Well, they're number one and number two in the conference at forcing turnovers. So, All right. Well, uh, that's not good to hear. 
Um, I, you know, I, it's, it's a legitimate point. Um, there's certainly going to be the need for, for guys like Cam and Kaluma, especially to, to not try to make plays that aren't there, which is really what I, I think they try to do. Cam in transition and Kaluma in the half court off the bounce, trying to get to the rim are, are really where most of those turnovers come. Um, so they got, they have to avoid those. And then the key, I think really is you've got to avoid the live ball turnovers. I mean, I think Mason, you mentioned yesterday, Iowa state was turning TCU's turnovers yeah. into points like crazy. Um, and that's where you really get yourself in trouble in these games. If, if you have turnovers that turn into buckets on the other end, I remember Frank Martin one time saying that he, he, he wanted to tell his guys, if you're in trouble, just throw the ball out of bounds. Cause that's better than giving it to them where they can get a layup and transition. Yes, it was also one of the few games K-State lost fast break points. Um, they ended up winning points off turnovers 13-11, but they lost fast break points uh, to Oklahoma State. Usually they've won fast break points most of the time this year. Uh, so um, that's going to be something to watch in this game. I mentioned earlier is K-State's ability to get to the rim um, will be big, but also that that factor of, of – Live live ball turnovers that lead to fast break points um, are, is going to be a huge a factor because I mean, neither one of these teams wants to play fast, but they're going to run if they if they get turnovers, and that's really where you get the, yourself in trouble against teams like Iowa State and Houston. Yeah, yesterday in the first half, which Iowa State outscored TCU forty four to twenty six, they forced eighteen TCU turnovers and scored twenty nine points. Wow. off of them so 29 of their 44 points in the first half came off of turnovers uh iowa state themselves only turned it over five times in the first half now the script did flip in the second tcu ends up losing the game by only one uh and in the second half iowa state comes through and and uh things kind of slow down for all oh, okay never mind here let me let me amend something stat broadcast uh doing me dirty here reading this they say first half and second half but then you know some spots if you add it, it that's just for the game so iowa state in the first half they were i think it was 26 points off of turnover so they only got three of them in the second uh so that it slowed down but for the game they they were very active at it and, and the point still stands there with with what they were able to do and tcu was out of sorts and tcu has i mean I would say mindset-wise, guys that are pretty comparable to what K-State throws out there because if you've watched, like, we've seen Emmanuel Miller. He can be pretty aggressive with what he does. Obviously, I mean, in the past, they had Mike Miles, and Mike mm -hmm. Abibi thought, I could do that. Uh, Jameer <laughs> Nelson Jr. has been a lot like that this year, too, where there's some just put your head down and, and do whatever, and it can be costly. And they found that out yesterday because – I mean, Miller ended up with four turnovers. Nelson ended up with five. The real killer for him was Avery Anderson, the Oklahoma State transfer. He turned it over seven times yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that would be a scary thing for K-State uh, is the fact that not only are you turning the ball over, but TCU kind of set the example for what can happen if you're careless. And I, I think K-State has some guys that, in terms of mindset and how they play, profile similar to TCU so that would be the the one thing to watch. And obviously, then you have to factor the crowd into it. We've talked about it a lot this year, mm -hmm. but, you know, Hilton can be a really tough spot to go. And then Houston's just really freaking good. So good luck to the Cats there. It, and the other scary thing is, like, they, they had 13 of the 17 turnovers uh, yesterday were live ball turnovers by K-State. So yeah. Like it, it's it's a really scary thought when you think about how proficient these teams are in turning the ball over. You you worry about the crowd a lot more and and Ames getting into it than the crowd mm -hmm. in Houston. But yeah, it, it, it's one where it it is this team's Achilles heel and this team's flaw. It, and I just I don't know if it's going to get fixed because it, it's the same issue that they had last year. I mean it it not quite this extreme through five games of the big 12, but I mean, it, there were stretches last year where they, it felt like every four or five possessions was a turnover. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Uh, all right, let's roll on here. A little college basketball outsider time, look around the rest of the big 12. And uh, again, there are the big 12 standings, K state and tech 
alone at the top. Baylor, KU, Iowa State, Houston, and Oklahoma, all three and two in league play now. And then a large swath of teams at two and three. And then the Cowboys at 0 and 5. Uh, I'll start with fan here. Obviously, we've talked a lot about K State. Outside of that, what stood out to you from yesterday in the Big 12? Well, Osborne County coming up big again. Um, Josh Eiler really doing a really good job with that team after struggling through roster situations all non-conference. Now that team is playing at home anyway, besides against us, really good basketball. And, you know, get, getting that win over Kansas is not something I expected. Um, I'd say the, the other unexpected result um, – it's a tough, tough week if you're a Baylor fan because yeah, you blew two games in the last four, yeah. four minutes, really, and and uh, also you know a decent, decently impressive win by Oklahoma going to Cincy and getting a, a road win, so that was that was a solid game by them to to finish that one out. So those were the kind of the ones that stuck out to me. Uh, the the one that really kind of stands out to me. Uh, besides the West Virginia and KU and Texas and Baylor game, which, by the way, West Virginia just shot the lights out against KU. It, it was honestly really hilarious seeing like a team shoot that well that doesn't shoot that well and doing it against KU. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's yeah. that's like what I said before the K-State-West Virginia game was just <laughs> like just kind of you have to hope that they don't do something incredible that they're not capable of typically. And they they did it they did kind of did it in the first half against K State and then everything played out like it was supposed to in the second against KU the the Jayhawks did not get that luxury and I do not feel bad for them. <laughs> no, uh, the the game that kind of the other game that stands out to me is uh, BYU Texas Tech BYU mm-hmm. up sixteen at half and then loses the game by seven. Yeah, and that that's one where you just kind of shake your head and you don't really know what the heck happened there. And it's more for me of like, I don't know what to do with BYU when we do power rankings. I, I don't know if they're good. I don't know if they're bad. They're, they're just kind of there. Like they, they've beat UCF and Iowa State. And then they've lost to Cincinnati, Baylor and Tech. So like, it, like I, I just, I struggle to know what to do with them. And I kind of lean towards them being kind of fraudulent like Oklahoma is a little bit. But like Tuesday night, I think I'll learn a little bit more about BYU than I know right now. But like I, I just I struggle with them. I think the most out of every Big Twelve team. Yeah, there's there's live and die by the three, and then there's BYU, who yes. brings it up to a whole nother category. Fifty one percent of their shots are threes in Big Twelve play. Fifty seven percent of their shots are threes. Uh, and that loss to Cincinnati, 72% of their shots were threes at home. So they are going to put the ball up. And if I, I think it's just a case if, if they're making threes, it's going to be really, really tough to beat them. Um, if they're missing threes, then you've got a really good chance to beat them. Um, they are really good at twos, but I think it's just because they don't shoot them very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, they only take them when it's like, uh, I guess I have to do this wide open. wide open. Yeah, so that's the, it's going to be interesting. Vote. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I don't only think it's true if it was a layup. <laughs> I, I just think it's gonna be interesting to see if that if that style can win consistently in the Big Twelve, especially on the road. I think for me yesterday, and and what I look at from the Big Twelve and and kind of take away is, I mean, the the KU loss it really only reaffirms what I think most of us already kind of knew. KU's not really the third best team in the country. They're they they like and this is not a knock on KU. This is just a problem with everybody out there uh because of where college basketball is right now. I, I don't know that there's really a great team. And so many of these good teams at the very top are built on a very flimsy, you know, kind of foundation where for KU it's you really are only going to be able to rely on McCuller and Dickinson most of the time and and you need them to be special to come through for you and McCuller was yesterday it's just he he didn't get much help elsewhere I mean 
the problem Dickinson turns it over four times. He's not grabbing rebounds for you. And when you're KU and you're only pl- you're playing a three guard lineup, you need somebody to go and get rebounds. And they didn't do that yesterday. That they got beat on the glass, thirty one to twenty two. Um, now I know there weren't many missed shots in the game uh, because both teams shot over fifty percent. But that's something that needs to step up. And and for KU, like one of their glaring problems is that Dewan Harris plays all of those minutes. And in games where somebody needs to step up, like it's this is tight. This is you need some Dewan Harris, he's just not that guy. He is not an offensive threat at all. Y- yes, he is a he is a good passer, but spare me the best point guard in the nation crap that was being said last year by people. He wasn't even the best point guard in the state. And we are continuing to see that this year where DeWan Harris is a fine player, but he the scoring only comes when it's easy for DeWan. Similar to like what, what we're talking about where, hey, they shoot the twos really well, but it's probably because they only take them when they have to. It's like, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, this is this is easy for me here. He's not going to go be special for KU. And that's their issue is they have two really good players right now because Kevin McCuller at this point, like, we're so deep in the season. That's the real deal. Kevin McCuller is playing like an all American this year. Uh, he's playing like the guy that Bruce Weber recruited, you know, that's, that's what he's doing. Um, I, I just like, I, I think that reaffirmed, Hey, we know that KU is pretty flimsy where they're at uh, outside of them though. Uh, I will give credit to Iowa state going on the road and getting the win at TCU without Lipsy and how things played out there. Um, they tried giving it away, but they didn't. And TCU had been one of the better teams in the Big 12. And now all of a sudden they're tanking. Like, think of how different things look for them. They should have been 3 0 with three wins against top 10 teams. However, they, you know, had the thing go down in Lawrence. And after those two big wins, they're now two and three in league play. And they're kind of in a free fall and need to get things figured out. Uh, on a disappointing side, I mean, it has to be Baylor. Just mm-hmm. the fact you come off such a tough loss. And you, it, I mean, it's tight in the entire game with Texas, and you hit, hit the big shot to get it tied, and then you somehow let them get way down there by the basket and score easy. And that is a Texas team that, honestly, I think they've got a bad coach, and they're obviously mentally soft. They should not have responded that well after losing to UCF and being, you know, one of the only teams left with one win in the league. Like. Baylor should have gone out and won that game. I think you were playing a fragile team, and I think it goes to show Baylor's probably going to drop a little bit like a rock this year. I don't think this team is cut out uh, to handle the Big 12 this season. They're still going to be good. They'll be fine, but I'm riding Baylor off as contending with KU and Houston for a Big 12 title. I'll also circle back a little bit to KU for a second. You know, like you're, If you're KU, you're kind of searching for answers, I think, because you got – 25 points out of Johnny Furphy and Nick Timberlake who have been pretty awful for most mm-hmm. of the year and you still lost the game like that that's one where you kind of you they probably need to do a little bit of soul searching but I've seen this movie before I, they're they're gonna figure something out but yeah, they, the the thing that stands out to me too is like the, there were points in that game uh, when I was watching that they had uh, that like the wrong players were taking shots. It was guys like Furphy and Harris and Timberlake and El Marco Jackson taking shots when the game was tight. Like, how are you not getting the ball to Kevin McCuller? Yeah. And and my, my, my other thought on KU is what, what would they be if McCuller hadn't had this offensive regeneration of, of becoming a, basically a new player on that side of the court. And then, you know, just looking at KU right now, they're 10th in defensive efficiency in Big 12 games only. So usually Bill Self teams are elite on offense, but they're also elite on defense as well. And and them not being a, a top five defensive team is a, is a big surprise to me looking at um, their schedule. And, and they haven't played all the – I mean, UCF is the last worst offense in the league. West Virginia is the 11th offense in the league. So – um, they've they've done it against some some offenses that aren't great and still have a very low defensive rating. Uh, their offense is first, so you got to give them credit there. They're the best shooting team in the league right now, especially from two. But if they if they don't pick it up on defense, that's going to be the the problem for them down the stretch. Same thing could happen to Texas Tech. They're four and one in the league, but 
they're uh, 11th in defensive efficiency right now. Uh, so some, usually that comes out, come back, comes back to bite you. I know Mason, you're an offensive guy yep. and, and I, I agree with you. You need offense, but some days in this league, you need defense too. Yeah, no, they, you need defense. Uh, that I don't think that you can just be, you know, given layups left and right and, and defending at a poor level, but you know, me, I, I think you, you win games by scoring it. That's, that's True. how this game works. Uh, and the best defense is a good offense. And if you're, if you're, but if you're so bad on defense, and th- we've talked about this with K State, their defense has been so good that they have made teams play offense like K State does. And that's why K State then has the edge because these teams that are typically, you know, middle of the pack in both or whatever, they're not able to do anything at a, at a level that makes them comfortable. K State yeah. is at least still getting to play the game in one area that they're really good at and they can feel comfortable. Uh, I would say one thing that's hurting KU defensively is, I mean, your anchor, literally and figuratively, yeah. the guy in the middle and the guy that is weighing down your defense is Hunter Dickinson. He's just not a very mobile player. And if he can't succeed by b- being tall, then he's not going to do anything for you. And and that's he, he is an issue for them at times. Uh, and, and I mean, like he could probably be better for them or he needs to be better for what they really want to do and, and come out and be this year. Um, th- they're still a good team. They're still the team that I would, you know, pick to win the big 12. Cause we know how this thing plays out, but he's going to have to find a way to be, uh, you know, I don't know if you have to mask it a little bit more and, and try to help him out, but I think that's where a lot of their struggles come from defensively is he's just not a very good defensive player. Um, I mean, I, I the Field of 68 guys were talking about their loss last night, and Jeff Goodman brings it up and is talking about, you know, you've got this guy who's a, a good defender and then th- this guy, and he's like, you know, and, and Kevin and Hunter Dickens is good at being tall. It's like, <laughs> okay, that's what you're saying. Like, it, he's not a good defender. So, yeah. I don't know. That's, uh, that's the thoughts on the Big 12 right there. We got a full week coming up. KU is going to just probably be – very nasty to Cincinnati tomorrow night uh, on, on Monday. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, one final thing before we head out, we'll uh, we'll update everybody after TCU decided that uh, they were too scared to play the Wildcats on Wednesday. The seventh ranked women, they came back home uh, in front of over 9,000 yesterday in Bramlage. They beat KU 69 to 58. That was without Aoka Lee, who we found out will be out for four weeks. Uh, that, kind of drastically changes things for K-State in some ways. Um, they they kind of lucked out yesterday, though, because I had concerns going into that game that the KU women would give K-State kind of a taste of their own medicine where Aoka Lee goes out and K-State ends up being saddled facing a KU team that they have a big that they can kind of dump it into and let her pour it on at different points. Well, this was... Uh, Made a, uh, I was made aware of this after the game by Mitch Fortner, the men's game. So their 6'6 center on the inside who ended up not playing a majority of the game. She only played six minutes. Mitch said that she ended up getting teeth knocked out in the game yesterday, and <laughs> they had to go take care of it immediately because if not, then you know there would be nerve damage and all this other stuff that went on. So K-State kind of caught a break there, but they defended well for the most part. Uh, I think KU only made like two threes. They were really bad. Uh, in that department, K State forced a ton of turnovers, and they kept themselves pretty clean. So they found a way. Uh, they were up really big, and then KU was able to, I think, get it all the way down to four. But it never felt like K State was going to lose that game because of their defense. And now they've got a really interesting one on the road tomorrow night at Baylor, uh, a top twenty-five matchup. And and Baylor, you would think, probably wins that game now, just because K State is is down their their best player. But this same KU team they just beat, they blew out Baylor earlier this week. So there's a chance that they uh, keep this thing rolling. And it should also be mentioned that come the the top 25 when it comes out, um, you've already had three teams ahead of K-State in the polls lose this week. Iowa lost today to Ohio State. So the number two team has lost, which, again, K-State has a win over. So, you know, well, wait, what are we doing? Uh, and then NC State lost earlier in the week to Miami. And another uh, game that's going on right now, the number six and number three teams are playing with Colorado and USC. And Colorado already lost to UCLA this week. 
So uh, there, there is an opportunity that we're talking about a top five women's basketball team at K-State come tomorrow. Uh, and they, they've certainly been fun to watch, and they got a lot of good support yesterday. And as I, I told my anybody that would listen to me, I said, it doesn't matter the sport. It doesn't matter male, female, whatever. Uh, it's really fun to watch K-State beat KU. So that was an <laughs> enjoyable game yesterday, uh, and I was glad I got to go see it. I, I will say too, like you, you say that it might be an L without Aoka Lee and it still might, but UCF's women are kind of awful and they almost won in Waco yesterday. So, I mean, you, you look at it and in case it's got a shot there, they can win just about every single game because of how good that they defend. So you, you like the game to at least be pretty close. And just like in the men's, it seems like you look up and down. Winning on the road in the women's game is also insanely tough. So it, it'll be a fun matchup on national TV tomorrow night, which is fun. And you you just kind of got to wait and see about uh, what the status of K-State's roster looks like, because I think it was Briley Glenn that went out at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. so you kind of wonder about how she's doing and it, it, it's it's not impossible i mean case eight beat baylor i think it was uh last year or two years ago at home last year uh i think it was two years ago uh probably so yeah it can happen we'll see uh see how it goes i i also wanted to just mention this real quick because it kind of has become a tradition uh wichita state about to lose again uh, they are going to be dropping to 0 and 5 in the American, which, if you guys are unaware, Houston, Cincinnati, and UCF do not even play in the American anymore. So, three of the better teams aren't even in that league. They are about to lose to old friend Selton Miguel and yeah. South Florida. Uh, Heck of a week for Selton Miguel's squad. Good week. Yeah, they, they took down Memphis. Uh, they were down 20 in the second half and won. Selton Miguel, 23 points in that game. Five of ten from three. Uh, real quick before we get out of here, what is? I mean, nothing should have indicated that this man would ever shoot that well from three. It makes oh. zero sense. And not only that, he was bad individually. He transferred to what at the time was the worst three point shooting team in college basketball in South Florida, and now somehow he was 33% last season. This year, he's 48% on over five attempts a game. Uh, Selt Miguel turning into a real college basketball player, was that anything you guys expected? Well, uh, people on the board joke and say that Selt Miguel is like 30, so he's just <laughs> figuring it out late. Uh, by the way, four points today for Selton on 0 of 4 from three. Yeah, well, you can't be on every game. <laughs> I mean, he has been on a stretch. This is his first game since November 22nd where he didn't score in double figures. Yeah. He's – yeah, I, I would never have expected him to be this kind of shooter for sure. Not – you know, he was a 20% shooter with the Cats, so. Do you think he Not, still only goes right? I don't know. Probably. Uh, I he, he, he might be so good shooting the ball now, he doesn't have to go <laughs> anywhere but the three-point line. That's true. Uh, also, uh, an old friend check today. I know everybody's uh, intrigued about uh, what Naquan Tomlin's been doing. Uh, six points in the loss today at Tulane for Memphis. So as Ooh. good of a week as USF had, Memphis lost two games to USF and Tulane, uh, who have played some tight games yeah. with teams but found ways to lose them, does, except for when they played Memphis. So Does, does Memphis go top 10 to out of the poll tomorrow? <laughs> No, because people are suckers for Penny Hardaway, even though he's a fraud. So, <laughs> I, set but, you up. I set you up for that. Speaking of frauds, real quick, uh, thoughts and prayers to Mike Boynton and this wow. being his last year coaching Oklahoma State. Um, it just, although somebody was posted on the board, like he's got kind of an insane buyout yeah, still. Yeah, his buyout's eight mil. I mean, who That's made that agent. deal? That's a good agent. Also, I mean, also, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say it's not fraud watch. If you're never, you were never good. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I, he's yeah. a, he's a fraud though, for how long he's gotten to keep that job. 
and only having one good season when he had Cade Cunningham's brother as an assistant coach. If we're calling fraud watch on anybody, I'll just I'll name drop and say Dennis Gates fraud watch. Mm. I like that. I like that a lot. Fan, do you have a fraud you want to throw out there before we we get out of here? I not not a not necessarily at this time. I don't, and I I don't know that there's really one in the Big Twelve. I mean, even though they just won, I, Rodney Terry would be the 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 one that would be on the fraud watch probably. This Fans season. a lot nicer than we are. <laughs> you don't have to be nice to these guys. Uh, I I don't think I, I don't think there are many frauds in the Big Twelve right now. Uh, but Rodney Terry definitely seems like the king of the frauds. Um, I would I I will say this. Uh, at what point do we start to to give Jamie Dixon the Matt Campbell treatment of yeah okay. You've done impressive things for what this program had been. At some point now, you've got a good program on your hands. How about you do something a little bit extra? Because, you know, Big Dixon here, he still has not ha finished above 500 in Big 12 play, and they're not off to a hot start with their 2-3 and three record right now. So I would put Jamie Dixon, he's definitely, he's definitely on fraud watch right now. He's not a fraud warning like Rodney Terry. Yeah. But he's on fraud watch. Yeah, I do. Bet, I I do bet Pitt would take Jamie Re Dixon results right now after running him off. Uh, they got they got a win in the NCAA tournament last year. What are you talking and, about? And a big win last night against Duke. Oh, yeah. that's true. They did beat. I I miss that. I I just know that they've been struggling most of the season. Oh, they've been they've been pretty awful. Besides that, but that yeah, that I, I watched them. I watched them win it NCAA tournament last year. I mean, how dare Why? you try saying that? <laughs> Jeff Capel is a fraud. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand how you could come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah, no, not, not great there. All right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll close up shop here with that K state big week. Uh, they didn't lose a game men or women. Man, this is the final thing. Either of you think K state's in the top 25 tomorrow. I don't, I'll, I'll say no. Okay. All right. So you guys are haters still. I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> Uh, K State on the road this week at Iowa State. We were all three of us will be there, me, Drew, and DY. So full coverage from that pre, during, post, uh, and then anything else going on with K State football stuff is always over at K State Online. And uh, Dante Cephas is officially a cat. He made that known yesterday after attending classes all week. Uh, <laughs> it would seem and being out with the team and photographed. He finally was like, yeah, I guess I should probably make this uh, official so people know. So uh, if you haven't gone and watched our Dante Cephas breakdown video, go find that over on the YouTube. So that will do it for us. For Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan, I'm Mason Vogt. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Sunday Show.